Good morning. So as Tom announced, a lot of us um, are getting over being sick or or pretending not to be sick. Um, my wife and daughter are sick this morning, and so you'll be keeping them in, in their prayers. And, and, I, and I just want to, and I told my wife this this morning when she was looking miserable on the couch, cuddling our daughter, that I'm just the type of husband that believes in sharing. And so as I was sick most of this week, I thought it was only fair that I would share that love and experience so that, that she could know what her husband was going through uh, through most of this week. And so she's at home thinking poorly of me right now. Um, but uh, I uh, still have plugged up ears. So if I, uh, if I talk too quietly, I can hear myself just fine while I stand here because right now I just have this echo in my head. But if you can't hear me, you can just wave me down. We're, we're a small enough group this morning that uh, I won't mind. So, <clears throat> Before I return back to Acts, where we were um, before we talked about Advent and coming into the Christmas season, I wanted to use this occasion, this day of, of, of the new year, uh, to talk about something uh, that I view uh, foundational, uh, to help us, the uh, way I look at it, to kind of start the, the new year off uh, on the, the same page with a bit of uh, a similar foundation. Uh, through the years, uh, the majority of my uh, contentious uh, theological uh, discussions um, have been with uh, Christians who claim to love Jesus and hold to a biblical worldview. They love Jesus, and they claim that the Bible is their authority for what they believe. And, and usually how it starts is we'll be in a conversation, and they will say something that, that causes me to have to ask uh, further questions about the statement they have made. Because they've made a statement that, while it might sound pious, it might sound like something that we would find in Scripture. Um, it, I, I am not familiar with where that would be in Scripture. Uh, and, and, I'm not, and I don't pretend like I have the Bible memorized, um, but it is unusual that somebody can say something to me that I don't have a general place that I can find it in Scripture. Um, but it happens at times. And I, and I remember this one occasion years ago, uh, there was a couple at the church we uh, belonged to that wanted to take Karen, out to, Karen and I out to lunch. And while we were at lunch, this husband made a statement that uh, kind of caught my attention. And it was regarding this one pastor who he had a, a relationship with that he loved, um, who supposedly had the gift of prophecy. Um, and this pastor had made a prediction regarding the, the day of, of the, the day and time when Jesus would return. And he could tell by the look on my face that uh, I, I wasn't really approving of this pastor's comment. And he sort of incredulously asked me, like, oh, I suppose you think he's a false prophet. You know, he said that to me like, I'm the weirdo for thinking that perhaps there's something wrong with this man's um, I don't know, communication freeway with God. You know, God supposedly told him that, that Christ was going to return on this day and time. Uh, Jesus did not return on this day and time. And I was like, well, where would that put you when you consider the words of Deuteronomy 18.22? That if somebody claims that they have spoken because God has given them a message, and it does not come to pass. God says, you don't need to fear that person because the words of the Lord are not in them. So how would you reconcile Deuteronomy 18 with this pastor friend of yours? Or, or how would you reconcile Jesus' own words that nobody knows the day or the time 
well, maybe it was my tone. I, I don't think I said it much different than I'm saying it to you this morning. Um, but he was going to have no part of this conversation. And he actually left the lunch. It was just too much for him to have this conversation. What's interesting is that this, this family are people who love Jesus and claim to have a biblical worldview. You know, we, we use these words in Christian tradition, like holding to the sufficiency of Scripture, the authority of Scripture. Uh, every week when we gather here, and as we will do this Sunday, every time we come together, I, I have this book right here, and I have a passage that we are going to read from. And I ask all of you to stand up in reverence for the words that are in this book. And I think for most of us, we recognize why we're doing that. We recognize that there is authority in these words. But what I'm not convinced of is that we all have the same understanding of what I'm talking about, or what many of us mean when we say that the Bible has power and authority and sufficiency and clarity and necessity. There's these elements to the doctrine of Scripture that have been, that have been taken from Scripture that Christians understand of, of why it is that we hold this Bible in such reverence. And this is something that I, I, I feel is, you know, there's a part of me that, as I was thinking about sharing this message this morning, that wondered, like, is it necessary? <clears throat> I mean, I, I know that most of the people here, and, and most of the people here that I've had conversations with have, have never led me to believe that this is something that I need to be concerned about. But yet, at the same time, I understand that we hold on to traditions in our heart that are difficult for us to displace. That, that we grow up believing a certain thing that, that even if we don't know the, the chapter and verse, we still believe that, well, it, it must be in the Bible. And so what ends up happening at times is that our traditions or how we grew up in the faith land up taking precedent over the Word of God. And so one of the things that, that, that I have realized when I've talked to people on this subject, and, and we've even had this same conversation together, uh, where when we're talking about what it means to say that Scripture is the Word of God. Now, I could ask questions right now, and I feel as if the majority of the people in this room could affirm these things, that you would affirm that the Bible is the Word of God, that it is, that you would affirm the inerrancy of Scripture, that you would affirm that Scripture is sufficient, clear, authoritative, and necessary. But what I want us to wrestle with a little bit this morning is to ask ourselves and explore the topic of, of are we living that way? Are these just things that we can intellectually assent to, but are we living a life that reflects this to be true? And friends, this is not uh, just some academic exercise. Uh, to, to affirm the, the doctrines of Scripture has direct influence, direct impact on our faith and in our life. Because one of the things that, that I'm sure you have run across, and I've, and I've talked about it before up here, is that there are so many times where you'll be interacting with somebody who claims to love Jesus and believe in the authority of Scripture, and yet, half this book, they don't believe in. Friends, you 
we're not in a position to reject, to redact certain parts of this book that we don't like. That won't help us. That would be like going to a doctor, and the doctor gives you a negative prognosis, but when you go home to share it with your family, you only told them about, well, the waiting room was super nice, and, you know, they had candy for kids, and I thought I would just help myself. It was a wonderful experience. And you just leave out the rest of that doctor's appointment that was not so pleasant, that didn't actually involve what the doctor told you, because you didn't like it. And so this morning, I want to talk about the importance of the Bible in our life and faith. And I'm doing this because, just as I've done in the past in opening the Word of God every Sunday, um, I will continue to open up the Word of God every Sunday. I will continue to preach from the Word of God every Sunday. And instead of just assuming you know why I do that, I want you to have that same that same passion of understanding the significance of, of why I do that, why there are so many people in this room who expect me to do that, and why that should be the expectation in our own path and in our journey in faith. So to help us shape this understanding of the importance of Scripture, um, our text this morning is going to be from Psalm 119. I would love for us just to stand and read the whole thing, but I know I'll lose some of you quickly and I will eventually lose all of you in that endeavor. So I'm going to focus in on Psalm 119, the verses 89 through 96. Psalm 119, verses 89 and 96 through 96. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day. For all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I considered your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this time of fellowship together for this this beautiful new year that you have shown us with love and mercy. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would illuminate your word, that you would soften our hearts to receive it, to understand it, that you would provide conviction upon us to live our life by the precepts, by your, the commandments, by the instructions that you have laid before us in this book. That you would teach us your ways, your, your love and your holiness. That it would drive us to repentance and it would grow us in our faith. Lord, your word is a miracle and a blessing that you have given to us. And Father, I pray that each and every single one of us would treasure it in our heart. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless our time together. I pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Sorry, my throat is a little dry this morning, so I will probably be trying to drink fluid as I talk this morning. So Psalm 119 probably all familiar with it, knowing that it is the longest single chapter in all of the Bible, that uh, it is comprised of 22 uh, different uh, category sections built around the Hebrew alphabet. And each category, each section of Psalm 119 um, has eight verses in it. The structure of it is fairly simple. It doesn't really follow a, a larger organized theme in the sense of it's not like a systematic theology where it it's, has this major premise and it's building this point through its 176 verses. Um, instead, what you discover when you look at Psalm 119 and the reason why, sorry, I, I broke that one. 
<laughs> um, is what we see when we look at Psalm 119 is instead of having a, a, a bunch of different uh, points that it's trying to make, what we discover in Psalm 119 is this reoccurring theme that, that's continually brought up in this text. This constant reference to God's word, God's instructions, God's precepts, His law, His commandments, His command. It's this repetitious. Every, almost every line in Psalm 119 returns to this, this acknowledgement of the importance of God's word. In fact, out of the 176 verses that we have in Psalm 119, 174 of them, the only four, are missing any reference to God's word, God's instruction, God's command. 174 verses of Psalm 119 contain this, this pointing back to the significance of, of God's word. And so what we see in Psalm 119 are these two immovable... Hey, Eric, could you forward the slide one over? Thank you. So in Psalm 119, we see that there are these two immovable truths that are reoccurring through Psalm 119. One is that we see the the significance or the, the permanence of God's Word. That God's Word does not change. It, you begin to realize when you not only take in all of Scripture, but even if you just stayed in Psalm 119, you begin to realize that there is this, this essential connection between God's Word and God's actual character or, or who He is. And the second truth that we see so evident in Psalm 119 is that the the relationship or the intimate proximity of of the writer of Psalm 119 is that that he connects, that that relationship he has with God is is connected through God's Word. So part of a pattern that we see in this psalm is that the psalmist makes a truth claim regarding an aspect of God's Word. A truth claim, meaning that These two things are true. One of the things I always like to remind people that we need to recognize when we look at God's Word and we see it so evident in Psalm 119 is that we say things like that the Bible is God's Word or that the Bible is authoritative or that the Bible is powerful. These aren't truth claims coming from past academics or from pastors. These are truth claims that the Bible makes of itself. The Bible says these things about itself. And what's so wonderful about Scripture that that I want to remind us of this morning is it's not as if the Bible makes these truth claims and just expects you to believe them. I've often heard people make the comment that, well, we just take that on faith. Friends, faith, Christian faith, the whole, the whole way that God has revealed Himself in space and time is not based on that, that statement. Well, we just have to take it on faith. The reason why this book is so big, and the reason why this book is presented to its, is, has been created over 1,500 years by 40 different authors, is not so that the premise, you just have to take it on faith would hold water, but that we could come back to historical truth that have been demonstrated and proved that God would say He was going to do something. God would do it. And then He would record when He did it. So we wouldn't just have to say, well, you have to take it on truth. Instead, there's this recognition. No, God has told us, God has shown us, and God has reminded us. And so from the very start of the the passage that I'm having to look at this morning, (laughs) there's this recognition 
one of the primary truths presented before us is that God's word is, is permanent. He, he makes this comment and this statement in verse 89. And then what we see going on past that in the next three verses is, is the writer's verification of this claim, his evidence that this is true. Your faithfulness endures all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand this day for all things, all your servants. The writer of this psalm is pointing back to previous generations as evidence of God's faithfulness. He's pointing out that God's faithfulness was realized even before the the foundation of creation was was put forth. The author recognizes that God's word is powerful. He reveals that God's word is clear and understandable. We see that the writer of this psalm, he delights in it, he seeks after it, he considers God's word, and, and ultimately he is freed by God's word. These elements of of the doctrines of Scripture become evidently clear. They just come to the surface in section after section of Psalm 119. This whole entire psalm just continues to repeat that whole pattern that that I mentioned earlier of, of the sufficiency, the clarity, the authority, and the necessity of the Word of God. The acrostic to help us understand, to remember. Hey, Eric, you forward it one more time. Is that the next slide? Go again. Thank you. The acrostic that helps us remember the, the four uh, minimum uh, elements of the doctrines of Scripture. Uh, we build it off the word scan is sufficiency, clarity, authority, and necessity. It's recognizing that the Bible as God's Word, that the Bible is as God has wanted to preserve it, or as God wanted to record it, and then how God wanted to preserve it. And, and that we, we see that that, that holds true as, as one considers everything that's, that's in this book. That we look at Scripture, that it was preserved as sufficient, that it's clearly understood, that it's authoritative in its message, and that it's necessary for us to know God and to have a, a saving relationship with God. You know, when I was preparing the sermon and I mentioned it before we read our text, is, you know, I've never, never, have I met an evangelical who has disagreed with me on this, this minimum standard of the doctrines of Scripture. But at the same time, in, in many of my theological, contentious discussions that I've had over time, um, what we discover is that the, the, the contentions that we often have are, are not one of interpretation. It, it's rarely where we have a, a single Bible passage and we're wrestling with the Bible passage and what it means and, and using other Bible passages to help clarify what is being given to us in this Bible passage. Oftentimes, it's left with this well, I don't like the way that reads. I don't believe that. My Jesus wouldn't do that. Where does that leave the discussion when, when somebody says that? And while at the same time, they're holding to this idea that, that Scripture is clear, Scripture is authoritative, Scripture is sufficient, when you take that step back and you say, well, yeah, I don't believe that. Where the challenge is actually being placed 
is on the doctrine of Scripture. Is that they have placed their own feelings over the authority of Scripture. They have placed their own understanding, their own perspective, their own traditions over authority and clarity and sufficiency. And so this is why understanding the, this doctrine of, of Scripture becomes so critically important. Because ultimately, how we view Scripture, of, of what this book means in our life, absolutely does impact what we believe in and how we live out that faith. And I think the reality is, and, and I think this also holds true even within my own life, is that there are some inconsistencies in the words that I read and the words that I study and what I claim to believe in at times versus what God has called us to in how we live our life. So for example, just looking at Psalm 119, if we considered verses 105 through 107, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. For once again, verse 105, there's this recognition of the authority and sufficiency of God's word. That it is a lamp to the writer's feet, a light to their path. Verses 106 and 107 recognizes the author's comprehension and recognizes the necessity of, of, this, of his word, of his teachings to his very life and existence. Throughout this psalm, you see this tension between what God uh, expects, what, there, this tension between the, the human author recognizing God's righteousness and holiness, his this call towards righteousness and this man's inability to do it apart from God's grace and God's word and God's instruction. His response after verse 107, you know, he's, he's his response in trying to keep God's righteous rules is this, he is severely afflicted and connecting this thought is a plea for help. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. When I look at this psalm, I'm, I'm reminded of the fact that when we look at the writer of this psalm, there's this recognition that, that he lives in a context similar to ours, meaning that he is surrounded by sin and wickedness, by temptation and desires that are unholy that God has called him not to pursue. We don't look at this text and, and think to ourselves, well, well, this guy has it figured out. He's just a super pious guy. You know, where he seeks help is the exact same place we should be seeking help. But what we see in Psalm 119 is a model this picture of, of pursuing God, pursuing God through His Word. Instead, you know, the, the contrast to this is, is what, in what we see happening in many flavors of, of, of the modern church. This recognition that if, if there's some doctrine that doesn't preach well anymore because it has a special interest group, well, if that happens, then we as the church just need to turn a blind eye to that behavior. Because clearly, God did not know that that's what the future would look like. That as long as it has enough political clout and social status, that's a sin we can redact from the Bible. That's not what the writer of the Psalms, Psalm 119, gives us. He said he gives us a picture that he is surrounded by wickedness. He's surrounded by all this, this evil. And, and he's crying out to God to, to save him from it. To, be a, to use God's word as a lamp, as a, as, a, as a guide to keep him on the, 
on the right path, to keep him having a relationship with God, to keep his eyes focused on truth, that he would know what truth is. As you work through this this psalm, it's just this repetition of of being called back to this, this powerful message that God has recorded and preserved for us. What we should see when we look at Psalm 119 is that the writer of this psalm consciously and purposefully submits himself under God's Word. That's so important for us to recognize. That that we don't come to God's Word and and we look at the simple stuff that's easy for us to recognize and the simple, easy things for us to live our lives by and say, well, those are the things God wants me to do. The things that are more difficult to believe, the things that are more difficult for me to apply in my own life, well, those must apply to other people. We need to recognize that submission to God is not a natural part of our relationship with God. From that very moment when the serpent deceived Eve and Adam willfully joined in in the sinning, from that very moment, we have had a contentious relationship with the one true and living God. We need to be reminded that we are not God. And so when we look at God's holy word, it is something that we need to submit ourselves under. We need to take those hard things that God shares in his word and be willing to say God's word is right, even if I don't like it, and submit ourselves to be under it. And one of the tough things is, is even though I see a lot of nods of agreement, I know that there are a lot of doctrines in this book that we have rejected simply out of tradition. We don't have a biblical argument for it. But we have a tradition. And it needs to be cautioned towards us. One of the prevailing thoughts that existed back in the times of Israel and exist today, is that continuing notion that I'm not that bad. And it's, it's one of the, the major struggles that exists within the church today in, in when, when Christians go out to do evangelism in a Western context. It's this idea of, well, it's, it's not a, I'm like I'm Hitler or something, so you know, clearly if I stood before the judgment seat of God, I, I think I'll be doing okay. I mean, after all, God is love. And no loving God is going to punish me for, for you know, the handful of sins I have committed. That's not a biblical thought. That's, that's what the world wants us to believe. That's the exact same lie that the serpent told Eve. No, God's not going to kill you. No. No, I, that's not what he meant. And yet that is exactly the same sort of prevailing mentality that exists today. One of the points that's important for us to understand when we talk about the authority and sufficiency and clarity of Scripture is that all these things that we do embrace, right? The, the theological ideas that don't get much of the, the, the fighting, like when somebody says God is love, even the most devout atheist in the room will stand up and say, yes, the God I don't believe in is love. We recognize you know, God is forgiving. Yes, God is forgiving. We'll disagree on what God is forgiving us of. What's interesting is we will accept, again, I just pulled this number out, making it up, 50%. We agree with 50% of the book. The other 50% we disagree with. What we need to recognize, though, is that we don't have that power. We don't have the authority to, to put a black pen to this Bible and redact the parts that, that we don't like. Because the reality is that, that if God is true, 
if God is faithful, if God has written this book, if we're able, if we're willing to agree on these points, then we need to recognize that, that those same truths hold true throughout the entire book. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is briefly are these four points that just so that we understand the definition or the meaning of these words as I'm using them. When I talk about sufficiency, clarity, authority, and necessity. But when I talk about the sufficiency of Scripture, what we're doing is we're recognizing that the Bible is sufficient um, in that, that we're affirming that the Bi- in all that the Bible contains with its teachings. So in all of its teachings, we recognize that it's sufficient for uh, uh, revealing God, uh, it reveals everything we need to know to be saved, and it tells us everything we need to know to live a life that is pleasing to God. And by sufficient, I mean that we do not need any other book or any other teacher to tell us how to do these things. That ultimately, if you had a theological or question about God, you're more than welcome to come talk to me, but I'm going to point you back over here. That the answer is in this book. And we always need to be concerned with teachers who cite teaching that doesn't come back to this book. Even if it sounds really profound. Because this book is sufficient. When we say that this book is clear, I am not saying that there are not difficult uh, or mysterious comments or statements made in this book. There certainly are a handful of them. But what we're saying is we're recognizing the majority of Scripture where God wants us to know Him, to understand Him, to understand His holiness, to understand the amazing things that He has done to demonstrate His faithfulness, His power, these elements, these characteristics of God, Scripture is abundantly clear. And even beyond that point, understanding Scripture allows us to better understand the world. We see that even in Psalm 119, verses 98 through 100 where the psalmist writes, Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all of my teachers, for your testimonies are a meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. Look at the authority of Scripture. The Bible claims It claims to be the Word of God. Throughout this psalm, as I mentioned earlier, there is this constant, this frequent reference to His Word, His command, His commandment, His ordinances, His precepts. This book constantly refers back to itself as being the Word's of God. Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 even makes this point more clear. Paul writes, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for the training in righteousness. The man of God may be fully equipped for every good work. Part of this this passage that I think so often we skip over is that beginning out. All Scripture is theonostos. God breathed out. The, the, the image that, that's being expressed here, this recognition that, that Scripture is interconnected with, with God. It, it, this, this book, the words in this book are a, a byproduct of God Himself. In the scripture, that these words are not some sort of secondary exercise that God had created, that, that these words in this book contain his very essence of, of his character, of who he is. It's the reason why it, it affirms the goodness of God, his 
faithfulness, his, his, his amazing mercy and patience. It records these things because all of these are a byproduct of who he is. And he is the one who's inspired the very words that are recorded in this book. Or as Second Peter writes in or as Peter writes in Second Peter chapter one, verse two, that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The authority of Scripture exists because the source of Scripture is from God Himself. I've, I've also been involved in those conversations. Maybe you believe this as well. But uh, there are people when we're, we're talking Bible, they'll quote the, word, the red letters in their Bible, the, the here are the words Jesus spoke. And they'll quote the words of Jesus over, say, the prophet Isaiah, as if they would ever be in conflict. But the point that, that they want to make in their heart is, but these are the words of Jesus. Friends, these are the words of Jesus. The, the red letters in the Bible don't have any special weight or significance that is any greater were more valuable than the words of Paul. And to, and to argue that they do would begin with the premise that there must be teaching against each other. And they are never teaching against each other. And so when we look at this book, when we consider the authority of this book, it's not the authority because a pastor says it's authoritative or because men of, who are who are more brilliant than, 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 than other people have said that it's authoritative, or church councils have said that it's authoritative. It's authoritative and has always been recognized as authoritative because of the ultimate author of this book. But again, the importance of understanding who wrote this book, the sufficiency of this book, the clarity of this book, the necessity of this book, those elements, are, again, are not just academic. It's important because understanding that is true helps us become closer to God by knowing who God is and, and what God wants for us. Knowing God's holiness. Knowing how to be obedient to God. There's a story in 2 Kings chapter 13 where a prophet of God is coming to make a prophecy and his job, God gives him a very clear and limited uh, uh, task, and God says, and then leave. You're going to walk into the city, you're going to deliver the message I have for you, and then you are going to leave. And God is clear. You're not going to stay for lunch. You're not going to stay for food or drink. You're going to come into the city, you're going to deliver the message, and then you're going to leave. And so, the prophet of God comes into the town, sees the king, shares his short little message, and the king says, thank you. I would love for you to stay for food and for drink. The prophet says, nope, can't do it. Even if you offered me half your kingdom, I can't stay. God has told me I got to go. The king's like, oh, all right. So the prophet starts to leave town, and there's another prophet in town. He's an old prophet, a respected prophet. And this other prophet comes up to the, this prophet and says, hey, before you leave town, why don't you come by my house? I'll feed you lunch. You can have something to drink. And then you can go. And the prophet says the same thing. Nope, I can't do it. God has told me if anybody invites me to stay for food, I can't do it. I have to go. And this old prophet says, but I'm a prophet of God. And an angel has told me to invite you to have food. And has told me that you need to come to my house to eat and to drink. And this prophet says, oh, you're, you're a prophet? I am a prophet. Okay. And so, the prophet goes to the old prophet's house, and they're sitting around the dinner table having a meal, and then God speaks to the old prophet to share a message with this other prophet. And the message from God is, through this old prophet, is, you have disobeyed me. 
I told you not to eat or drink in this town. And because you have disobeyed me, you are cursed. Friends, this is not an Old Testament riddle. This exact situation happens in so many churches across our nation where we have people who, who, who've given themselves the, the title of prophet or have given themselves the title of apostle or they carry the title pastor and they will stand up there on stage and they will make these comments. God has told me that Donald Trump is going to be president. Friends, Donald Trump is not president. God has told me that COVID is going away. It stuck with us for two years. And it never really did go away. It just stopped becoming worthy to talk about. Over and over again, we have these people claiming that God is speaking through them. Their prophecies do not come to pass. And then what we see is this collective yawn in Christianity of like, ah, maybe that's how God does it today. Friends, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And the only way that we will know that as believers is if we are reading this book. You know, last week I made that reference to that 400 years of silence. Some Bibles will at least commemorate that moment with that blank page between the two Testaments. That blank page is far more respectable than the notion that some people have run with that all of a sudden God changed in that 400 years. God did not change in that 400 years. God was preparing a people for His Son. In closing, I was hoping that Forrest would be here this morning because I think he's maybe the only one that would really appreciate what I'm about to say. But uh, I was reminded when I was preparing this sermon and thinking about why this is just so important for us as Christians to to wrestle with and to think about. That, that this isn't something that we should take for granted because some of us who have grown up in the church our entire lives and this whole idea of the authority of Scripture is not something foreign to us. Um, and if that's where you're at, where this is not foreign to you, I, I still invite you to wrestle with this and to think deeply about what we're talking about when we talk about the doctrines of Scripture. And, and as I was thinking about that point, it brought me back to, to, to Vince Lombardi in 1961. I know many of you know the story. Um, but Vince Lombardi was coach of the Green Bay Packers. They've had, uh, they were an amazing football team. Um, they had an amazing season um, going into 1961. Uh, they were leading the championship game uh, the year prior. Uh, in the fourth quarter, they were leading. They should have won the game, but they lost. They lost to the Eagles. Um, but they were a good football team. And so, first day of training camp the next season, June 1961, basically the team was expecting that they were going to do great new fancy things, that they were going to continue to build upon the great year that they had previously. But the reality is when Vince Lombardi looked at what happened in this football game, he, he looked at it and, and he recognized that, that this wasn't a lack of effort by his players. It wasn't a lack of heart by his players. It wasn't a lack of, of planning, a lack of, of, of trying. I mean, it, when, you, when he looked at what happened in the game, it wasn't this, this terrible breakdown of just negligence. Instead, what he recognized, what the breakdown of the team was, was, was the foundation, the fundamentals of what made them an effective football team, what made them so effective as a team. And so what made this story almost folklore at this point is that the very first day of training camp, he has these professional athletes who've basically been playing football their entire lives. And here 
The team has one expectation for what the coach is going to say, and instead the coach stands before all of these men, and he holds up a football, and he says, Gentlemen, this is a football. Because for Vince Lombardi, what he recognized for his team was that it was a breakdown of the fundamentals. That he had tackled poorly. They threw the ball poorly. They caught the ball poorly. They blocked poorly. They did everything they were supposed to do, but at the fundamental level, they did it poorly. And friends, we can say the same thing about our own Christian walk. You know, so many of us are, are wise beyond what, what, what we need to to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, to have a, a fruitful and rich relationship with God, especially in the West. You know, we know so much more about Scripture than perhaps other people in the world who, who do not yet have the, the written Word of God. We've got theologians running around everywhere. And in the previous church that I went to, I love the fact that where I sat in the church, um, I was surrounded by like five people that had either doctorate of ministries or PhD degrees in theology. In my Bible study class, I had three men in there who had PhD degrees in theology, who were former pastors or professors. I mean, we don't have a, a, a knowledge problem when it comes to issues of theology. Often what we have is a fundamentals problem. We're, we're not good at the fundamentals. We're not, we're not praying as much as we should. We're not seeking to, to learn this book to change our lives. We're, we're coming to this book just because well, we know that it's good for us. I think as believers, we've forgotten a lot of the, the fundamentals of what it means to have a fruitful Christian life. And so with that in mind, as I close this out and we move over to the Lord's Supper, this book that so many of us of us have uh, that we carry around, that we bring with us on church on Sundays. I, I want you to become reacquainted with it. They don't just look at it as just something that we pick up and read, but to, for us to recognize what, what this really is the authoritative Word of God. Beloved, this is a Bible. And I invite you to not just read it, but try to, to live it. To be convicted by it. To be changed by it. To grow closer to God through it. To know how you can please Christ by what it tells us to do. We pray for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your, for your special revelation. As with so many of the gifts that you have provided to us, we are not worthy of it. We do not deserve it. And yet by your faithfulness, by your love, by your mercy, by you continuing to demonstrate the attributes that you have shown to us, you have given it to us. Father, there are people in this world who, who treasure, who treasure this word, knowing who it is from, what it says, Father, give us that excitement and joy when we come to your word. That we would respect it, be in awe of, of 
of what you have shared with us. You haven't just given us, Lord, a tiny bit of information, Lord. You have given us abundant information to know your love and your grace. And ultimately, Father, how we are saved through your Son. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to press us upon our hearts, Lord, and help us walk true to what you have called us to. I pray this in your Son's name. I invite you, if you are a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, please partake with us. And then before we uh, share in this together, um, I'm going to say a few more words.